final panel is being moderated by William Stevens, CEO of E Unlimited. Now, he's very much a guru to my mind in this industry. He really you know, had the vision tw more than 20 years ago to understand this venture space, working at the EVCA and more recently trying to develop the tech tour to bring together the entrepreneurs from across Europe with the investors. He really is, uh, to my mind, one of the role models and gurus in this industry. So I was delighted when he was able to spare the time to be able to, um, you know, to pull together such an amazing panel. So I'm super excited to look forward to this. William, please take it away and do the introductions. I decided to, to uh, walk around because it's more effective as a, as a moderator. And uh, first of all, thank you, Jim, for putting on a great conference. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of events, and we like to say that uh, in our events, every other person that you meet or every person that you meet is the potential to change your life. Uh, and to be honest, this conference uh, has this potential. Uh, so I very uh, regret that actually I think none of you I really spoke to, so this is my <laughs> chance. <laughs> um, I will introduce myself, but uh, as uh, Jim rightfully said, we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, we'll introduce the topic later. And ladies first, let's start with Julia to introduce herself. I'm a professor and the head of the entrepreneurship department at ISC Business School based in Barcelona and with campuses in uh, Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Munich, New York, and Sao Paulo. Italian nobility. Gentlemen. <laughs> so I'm uh, Shiva Dusta. I'm the head of the um, Innovation Finance Advisory at the European Investment Bank, uh, which I would also co like to call the European Innovation Bank, which is, I think, more topical for today. Um, so, yeah. I will let you maybe know a bit later what we do, but we are basically, we want to make sure that there is more funding, uh, more financing going into uh, innovation um, and um, see what we can do to, to promote that, catalyze that, mobilize it with our own funding. What is the, could you just say how much money that you manage here? How much money the EIB manages? Well, uh, that, that, these are huge amounts. So last year we had roughly 80 billion euros in lending. We have a balance sheet that is around 600 billion euros, and uh, so these are big numbers. In terms of innovation, last year was 15 billion that went into innovation, but a lot of innovation also goes into climate change, adaptation of climate change technologies which are put under climate change, and there we're around 20 billion. So I think all in all, the bank is really, um, I would say, one of the largest financiers um, in, in this space, but ultimately the main thing that we would like to do is with our funding make sure that more private financing you know, is, is coming to, to, um, to highly innovative projects, new technologies, and so we don't, you know, we, the main thing is that we are not obviously crowding out, but we're actually bringing more financing to this. Okay. I'm Livio Scalvini, uh, I'm a head of corporate innovation in Intesa San Paolo. Intesa San Paolo, for those who don't know, is not a Brazilian bank, it's an Italian bank. It's at the fifth in terms of market cap uh, in the Eurozone. And uh, I deal with innovation, so with the internal innovation, so it's the fintech. <laughs> and uh, uh, most of all, uh, I deal with external innovation, so helping customers uh, to innovate, so to increase competitiveness through accelerating startups, uh, venture capital, and uh, uh, advising corporations to invest in innovation. So I'm also in charge of corporate venture for fintech. Great, thank you, Livio. My name is Michael, Michael Brunstrom, I'm management director of the Hightech Gründerfonds, HTGF, uh, which is a seed fund. In comparison with Shiva, we are very small. But uh, in comparison to other seed funds, we are large. We have 576 million euros under management in two funds. And next week, we will announce our third fund with a volume of around 300 million in addition. So we do seed funds mainly in Germany, and we invest at the beginning of the company's development, around 600 uh, euros, 600K. 
um, in order to, to develop the companies and we say we make them ready for the next round for venture capital. So we are really a seed fund and we uh, try to, to figure out uh, companies from science. Maybe one, one benefit or one USP we have is our investment structure. We have the government, the taxpayer on the one hand, and we have on the other hand uh, big corporates as well. And we, we will become more and more a private fund. The third one has 30% of private money on board. This, is, this will be 90 million. And therefore, the European Commission regards our fund as a private fund. That's a great progress for our organization. So I think we have a great panel with actually Europe's most active investor in number of deals per year, the High Tech Grinder Fund, <laughs> the largest bank in Europe, uh, EIB, uh, the fifth largest commercial bank, universal bank in Europe, in Eurozone, and actually the world's leading, uh, um, leading institution for executive education, ESA Business School. So a great panel. Um, we introduced ourselves, except myself. I um, want to ask you, um, who, is, uh, who is working for university? Can you put up your hand? Oh, okay. Who is working for a big company? A few more, 30%. Uh, who is the rest? Venture capital, government, venture capital, government, okay. All right, so we have uh, about 30% corporate, 40% university, and the rest is mostly government. Did I miss anybody? So venture capital, of course. Um, so myself, uh, I was formerly Secretary General of the European Venture Capital Association, now called Invest Europe, because it's mostly about private equity. Um, and I always had a passion for high-tech entrepreneurship. So I created a company that uh, platform that supports high-tech entrepreneurs to get faster to investors across Europe. Uh, European high-tech startups are valued at a fraction of US Silicon Valley based companies. They're actually the same type of technology. Of course, you could say they are more, uh, they're not as experienced in managing and growing and scaling companies, uh, but there is clearly an underdeveloped potential. Uh, we wanted to, I like this exercise this morning that was done. Could I ask all of you to stand up? <laughs> so stand up. And if you believe uh, that universities are broadly, broadly doing enough for tech transfer, creating economic value, could you please, uh, please sit down? So if you think universities are doing enough. Okay, nobody's sitting down. <laughs> There's one. There's one. Oh, one man is sitting down. <laughs> Probably didn't even get up, so. <laughs> <laughs> who, who believes that, so the universities can do more. Do you believe that corporations actually can get more value out of universities? Could you sit down? If they, if they can. If, you, if they could get actually more value out of it. So please sit down, so that, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll all be standing up for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> okay, that's great. So actually we are going to, uh, we want to make this very interactive. I will walk more and more into your, with you. Um, so we actually have a more mixed, uh, mixed audience that we thought we, we thought would be mostly universities. Uh, so it's a mix. Uh, so we'll have some quick questions, quick answers. But basically what we want to achieve from this session is to get better practice between universities and corporates. And we know the UK, I mean, that was already the conclusion before the, the session. Who is, by the way, from the UK? The vast majority. Uh, who's from the US? The vast minority. <laughs> okay, so it's mostly uh, UK. Is there anybody from the rest of Europe besides of the panel? Okay, three, four, okay, great. So, because we think that the UK is actually doing probably the best job from all over Europe. So, we are probably going to learn more from you <laughs> than, we, than you can learn from us, but that's fine. So, first question is, the title, uh, Startup to Scale Up, the title that we were given was about VCs, well, the, how can governments and corporates basically um, support more science-based um, value creation, but in particular through spin-offs. 
So this kind of implies that uh, um, that venture capital and business angels not doing enough. So it's really an important role for governments to play in this, and it's an important role for uh, corporates. So is this trend right? And I wanted to ask Michael and Livio. We are not very politically correct asking the men first to, to answer this time. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think that uh, this is a major challenge for uh, most of our economies in terms of capacity to uh, be more efficient in technology transfer compared to the Anglo-Saxons. And so uh, some of the issues uh, that uh, Anglo-Saxon meaning US and, uh, and UK, but it means that these changes is happening quickly in order to reduce the difference uh, that we have accumulated. One of the things uh, that I see in the economy that uh, where I'm mostly based is that uh, R&D center and university, due to the cross technologies that is emerging, are trying to work on a vert on horizontal more than vertical stuff because they lack even in each department to uh, how to really extract value. Secondly, what's happening is that there are R&D centers that are merging together. You know that instead of having, you know, even external R&D centers are trying to connect in order to have a, a broader capacity to, to interact. And what I also see is that uh, they are trying to transform procedures, uh, structure procedures into platforms in order to you know, avoid having you know, the, the issues of going around to detect the right thing. So now we, we, in some way we are trying to, in startups, to, to see global, but still sometimes we, we work local really on these issues. And this vertical topic I think is key in terms of uh, uh, you know, building efficiency. Um, the, the last thing that I would say is uh, but what is emerging, I'm talking about, you know, Italy, which is the, really the, the last comer. So, I mean, uh, it's the last one who could be here. So maybe I immediately sit there and I kid. Uh, uh, but, I mean, uh, what, what is emerging is that there are two challenges uh, in uh, this economy. One is on technology transfer and the other is on scale up. And on technology transfer, what has been designed uh, has been a strong allocation of public funding through European investment funds and uh, the Italian investment funds uh, that is going to be like fully dedicated on technology transfer without uh, further need of external uh, uh, investor. So they just look as smart team, smart team to work with university to force technology transfer into, into that field. And this is, uh, is creating an, a, a strong run to, to, to work with this topic. And I would add one last thing on this tool, that the best way would be to have uh, this small, ver small meaning 50 million, no, no, five, six funds of 60 million focus on technology transfer. But the ideal thing is that they could be connected with VCs. So maybe the team could go the, from the seed in the very early ticket and then have VCs uh, now with the same skills that could scale it at the same time. So Just these to maybe are, mention for everybody, the Italian state is putting 200 million euros on the table to fund five, six yeah. tech transfer funds. It's going to be called uh, yeah. Itatech and it's going to be done together with European investment funds. I think this is a huge challenge. It will force university to compete to be smarter and get the resources. So it will teach universities in, in our case to be more efficient in technology transfer. Well, from my point of view, I would like to distinguish between long-term and short-term uh, activities. Long-term activities might be to support entrepreneurship at school, at universities, uh, to, yeah, to, to um, uh, have more startups, and maybe even to um, create some incentive systems for professors or um, directors of science institutions to support spin-off activities. And the short uh, term, uh, I think it's important to have standards for IP transfer, which should be 
easier and faster. Um, and uh, another idea is to support the concept of buy and build. So if you have a great idea, an innovation at the science institution, you, you should organize the management and um, all, all around. So you, you take the technology and you buy or you build up a company by, yeah, by seed investors or so. That is not very often we have right now. So I think we can support that. Do you see, Michael, in Ger Germany is the largest economy, probably the most universities per capita or the most uh, you know, higher education uh, students. Do you see that actually venture capital and business angels are less investing in <coughs> high tech startups and therefore high tech greener fund, the government, regional government, national government, corporations are stepping up? Is that the trend? Yeah, well, the trend is, um the opposite, you know, we have we have a very high level of uh, state uh, activities, so grants and all this stuff. But uh, the business angels and venture capital companies are coming uh, more and more to look at early stage companies okay. as well. Yeah. Okay. Steven, please. Can I maybe just uh, step in because I think one thing that uh, one other element in this ecosystem are the research technology organizations like Fraunhofer um, in um, TWI in the UK. There are quite a number of them. Uh, we have recently done a study which you can also get on our website on these RTOs because I think we're talking university, we're talking corporations, but these RTOs are in the value chain doing more applied research, working as contract research uh, organizations for industry. And uh, it's something, I, w I don't know whether it's unique to Europe, but um, it is perhaps a distinctive feature uh, that we should also consider. And they are setting up right now also spin-off funds. So I just would like to maybe bring that into the mix that you know there is uh, perhaps in this value chain there are universities the RTOs, the corporations, and clearly, I think we, there is a huge alignment of interest in, in helping these ideas go from an idea to a, to a, to a, you know, to a company. And uh, you know, the, the beneficiaries are actually the larger corporations um, in I, that. I agree, I agree, it's very important, research and technology organizations. Is there any, any representative here from such? Okay, one, okay, great. Which one? Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer. Okay. Well, then, so, do you agree with what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, actually, as I said, we want to, to uh, drill on this collective knowledge that we have in the room to get some better practice uh, from corporates, how to work with universities, and how from universities, how to work with corporates. Uh, this is the biggest audience that we have. So. Uh, we are going to reserve 15 minutes to get your ideas. Um, so please, uh, if not, I will appoint volunteers, you know, to share the good experience from Fraunhofer, for example. <laughs> okay, so let's drill a little bit more down on, first, on corporates. Corporates working with RTOs, universities, academic organizations. What are some of the better practices that you see, uh, Julia, from ESA Business School? Julia did a big study on corporate venturing, uh, different forms of corporate venturing. It is, of course, as we discussed over the last 36 hours, an underutilized resource still. Um, so how do universities work well with, sorry, how do corporates work well with universities? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, we need to, uh, under the word corporate, uh, we find very different things. Uh, and I would like to, to take two things. One is uh, the pockets that they have. So large, large corporations with deep pockets have been working with universities for a long time, more or less effectively, but you know, they have put money for research and so on and so forth. Uh, so one is money, the other thing is time. How long are you willing to wait until you get something out of the university? And I think that with these two things, we, ha we find three different levels. As I said, the large ones, what I think it's, it has been going on for a, for a long time. Um, we see then a second layer where uh, what you can see is uh, corporates working already with the tech transfer, accelerators, incubators, so it's a little bit more closer to a commercialization, not yet, but still. 
And then there is the last one that probably is now the one that is being called because the need of innovation for corporations are being, uh, is, is, really, is really important. Uh, and what we see there is the, the, you know, a lot of uh, some, some kind of organizations getting into the ecosystem to play the role of the bridge between a corporation or a, or a, a good technology already almost ready for commercialization and the corporation. So I'm talking about models like venture client. I'm talking about excubators. So a bunch of organizations that are new uh, and they are coming up with very good solutions. Uh, in a way is almost outsourcing, but very, working very closely between the corporation and, and, uh, and the tech transfer, or even, even many, many times the tech, the tech transfer office. Uh, why I'm saying this is important is because I think money is not the problem at all, uh, private money or public money. The problem is the entrepreneurial capabilities or the managerial capabilities that we need to, to build these teams that later on are going to be scale up or, or, or internally. Uh, so, so some of the big corporations are also working on, on those models. So that's something that we see uh, coming up uh, in, many, uh, in many ways, and especially in these two or three models. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Julia. And Shiva, you see a lot of, you work with a lot of RTOs and universities. Yeah. So what do you see the corporates, uh, what is the, some of the good practices of the corporates? Yeah. Well, I mean, if a number of years ago, in 2009, we actually uh, lent um, 200 million to Philips uh, at the time. It was called the Open Innovation Loan. It came at the height of the financial crisis when pretty much banks were not willing to um, lend to corporates. We actually came in um, with a subordinated loan, so it wouldn't hit the rating trigger. Uh, you know, obviously companies were all facing difficulties. Um, now, the reason this uh, transaction to us, and it was a good practice that we wanted to support in Philips, was that they have what I believe, and, and many corporates have it, but they have a very active, open innovation model whereby they work closely with universities, with RTOs uh, like TNO, but also these institutes all over in, um, yeah, in basically not believing that all the R&D has to happen internally, but in fact that there is, uh, that they get more out of it when they, um, they do many different types of uh, collaboration with SMEs and, and academia. And so effectively we use the corporate as a channel to provide them with funding, and our funding had a condition that twice that amount goes towards this type of activity. And it came at a time when you know, the management of Philips was actually going to potentially reduce that type of activity um, because it was not seen as perhaps giving the, you know, the quickest returns because these are very often earlier stage R&D activities. So basically, to just show you that we, we believe that ultimately with corporates, at least when they come to the EIB, it's not for a plain vanilla loan for many, in many I mean, they can, of course, but what they expect from us is patient capital, risk sharing, and, um, and many of them already do this collaborative activity because they see that they need to tap into the SMEs, into the, you know, into the academia. And they're looking therefore for financing that in a way is supporting that business model. And for us, what it means is we need to then be ready to um, share in the risks. So what, what we try to do is set up, uh, prog I mean, we basically set up portfolios, effectively, or, or pick portfolios, research programs, and, and then may tie the um, repayment and the returns on the success or failure of, this, of the portfolio. So we hope to have some level of diversification. We hope to, of course, manage the asymmetric information, the, the risk of adverse selection. I mean, these are all very, you know, there are clear issues there. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we do see that, com that large corporates don't, you know, they very often require that additional risk capital that is off balance sheet and gives them the PNL relief, meaning that- you, you contradict each other a little bit because yeah. uh, Julia said it's not about capital. Uh, EIB, of course, uh, yeah. has a lot of you, your managing advisory group. Yeah. Michael, you have several <laughs> corporate shareholders that are uh, part of supporting high-tech Grindelwald. 
do you see some of them working well, actually, with universities and spin-offs? And actually, we have many corporates. I remember there were about 30% in the, in, the, in the group. Any good practices to share we would like to hear? So, um, Michael. Oh, yeah, yeah the, uh, for instance, BSF, the chemical group, they have a lot of activities to um, cooperate with uh, universities very intensively. Uh, they have a department for this and a huge crowd of people working on that. So they, I think they, they're doing it very well. And they cover a lot all over the world. They're connected with a lot of universities. The smaller companies, they don't have the chance to do that. They need another vehicle or another Small way company, to... The smaller ones, I mean, uh, smaller companies are not be able to, to cover the whole uh, scientific areas. Um, that's why they, they like to work with us or they, they like to work with we have Max Planck Innovation. That's the central uh, organization of all these science institutions called Max Planck. And there are many, and they are you know, centralized in one institution. And that would be also helpful. Fraunhofer has also such an instrument where you can go to one door to get access to many, many institutions. Mm -hmm. So that might help. And maybe that would be even a good idea for universities to centralize their ideas so that the, even this, the medium-sized companies have the chance to get in contact. I mean, you're advocating actually for the um, High Tech Greener Front is a super venture capital fund uh, to some extent. I don't know how many, s you have a portfolio of 500? Yeah, we have invested in around 464, uh, well, exactly 464 companies. How um, many could you classify as university spin-offs? It's around 30%. 30%? 30%. Let's include the science institutions as well. Okay. Uh, the others are coming from, sp they're spin-offs from corporates as well, and of course, from the garage. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> we, we will come back to, to you, Aset. Uh, we, we're actually going to come back to you very, very shortly. Um, but we also want to hear about some of the good practices of universities. Uh, we heard about corporate practice, and I think we need your input. Um, some universities in the UK of uh, Imperial Innovation have created these you know, venture funds, uh, which are independently managed, multi-university funds, basically outsourced completely the you know, venture process, the spin-off funds. Uh, so that seems like to be one of the good practices. Do you, do you see other good practices? And here maybe I uh, wanted to ask Julia or, or uh, Livio to... Uh, you refer to the example, of course, of the Italian government I think taking decision to put 200 million euros to work, creating effectively also multi-university tech transfer funds. Maybe uh, I think that there is an evolution in terms of uh, model that is already in place, and maybe something that sh may come as an option. And I think that. Uh, uh, now the, 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 the evolution uh, of uh, the technology transfer uh, and the VC should merge into something that is more close to you know, the venture development organization. So don't ask uh, from uh, an intellectual property to create, uh, uh, to, to find uh, casually an entrepreneur but give a vertical expertise uh, that will build in some way, the, the, you know, the, the, the model. And uh, so trying to have a focus on the product and have uh, the other structure uh, delivering the rest of the activities, we've seen uh, something uh, that is happening successful and is happening in uh, some deep science. So, you know, it's on biotech, uh, the, for example. One example is in uh, our market is BioVelocita, who, who comes from uh, you know, Syrian entrepreneurs uh, that are buying molecules and are building startups uh, uh, you know, on this area, which is a very tough one uh, for VCs uh, to do it. And in this case of Innova, and we are also investing in that, uh, came as an investor. So we're bringing entrepreneurs, ventures, uh, and uh, a link with the university to deploy you know, to deploy uh, <coughs> new startups, uh, we reducing the the risks in these new you are job. with Intesa San Paolo is uh, running this. You have been starting the startup initiative, which is a major 
in fact, investment readiness, investment matching program where you're helping hundreds of startups actually yeah. spin-offs included to prepare for meeting with investors. Yeah, this is a process to extract from university spin-off in order to, you know, to accelerate them into vertical technologies. So we select bio, clean, tech, nano, uh, ICT. We, we bring them uh, to investor readiness program to investors and to corporates. But we also try to expand the potential buyers by doing cross-tech in traditional industries. So on food tech, fashion. So you, you, you really need to redesign the value chain and pick up from any technology uh, the one that are more relevant to, to do that. And uh, this is to increase the rate of success of uh, these companies and at the same time to expand the potential buyers. So it's not just the large corporation, but also the mid corporations. And I think that is, uh, is key because in some way, when we are talking about manufacturing, it is true that we are talking about 15% on average on the European level, but it is true that uh, the full impact of manufacturing is more than 50% if you're considering services and. Uh, no, so it's, it's link, actually yeah. to um, venture capital is like a translator from universities to corporates uh, managing an intermediary phase of, of scaling companies at the end of the day, funding and scaling companies. Mm -hmm. It seems like at least one bank in Europe, and I, maybe there's others, maybe the UK banks play this role, <coughs> uh, question mark. <laughs> uh, but in Italy, the Intesa plays an important role, and I, I know that even some of your competitors do that yeah. as well. Something because when we are talking about comp international competitiveness uh, in vertical sectors, we have uh, you know, the, the leading anchor, the, the one that is getting the, to the market, uh, which is a, a large multinational, it could be German, French, uh, UK, US. But all the value chain has to be uh, able to de deliver the same kind of technology if they want to be still involved in the value chain. So the, the real challenge is not just the large corporation, but it's really to go deeper. Otherwise, we are losing not just one company, but hundreds of thousands of companies that do not manage to be connected. It's and I think that this is a huge challenge because now the, the, the skills, the, the fact is really about bringing open innovation uh, to the whole, all the society. And uh, this so is... So it's the role of the bank also to translate what startups are doing towards investors, including corporates, but also helping corporates Absolutely. to create the capacity to, to work with universities and startup community at large. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you want to add some points here about best practice of universities? Well, I would say that, that probably um, I'm coming from the business school, so I see the whole university uh, a need for training, uh, training not only the students, but especially the staff and the faculty in all the other parts of the university. Uh, we are working, for instance, with science, technology, also arts and philosophy, and you can see uh, entrepreneurs coming from those, uh, from, from those areas that are very, very interesting when you match them with the business capabilities that MBAs uh, or, or executive graduates may have. So I think that there is a first job inside of the university to really capacitate everyone uh, to, to look um, these innovations as something that can be you know, brought to the market uh, in, a, in a better way. So that's, I think, the first thing that I, I, I would say it's important. The second thing is reaching out into the, into the ecosystem. Again, there are many players out there that can use the university as a platform, uh, as a hub, as a place where uh, you can really build up a knowledge that can be passed through generations. Uh, because sometimes entrepreneurship is very, you know, very fuzzled. You know, it's not easy to, to get the, the one thing to the next. When you have a university that understands this, can really build the best practices and pass it uh, you know, along to the next generations. So for instance, uh, business angel network based in the university, the fund that we have in the university. So all this is helping to put together all this hub for the entrepreneurial and the investor community. So around that, you can, uh, at least this is, I, I have found that that uh, spans uh, a better entrepreneurial atmosphere and a better entrepreneurial um, activity. 
Thank you, Julia. And uh, th this is where we are turning to you for sharing some, some good practice. Although we have one, uh, you know, sweet thing to announce, uh, well, announce, at least the EIB wants to do more in this space of bringing corporates and universities together. But before we give that news, um, some good practice sharing. Um, Jim. Just one thought for myself. But Microphone you... is coming. Oh, right, yeah. okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's just one thought, really. Um, if you look at the R&D perspective, the top 100 corporations are responsible for about 53% of the R&D budget of the top 2,500 EC numbers. So thanks very much for that. It's very helpful. Um, but then if you actually look at the sort of patent of the companies outside of the top 100, the number of companies that have more than 10 patents within a portfolio... You know, funny enough, we've got the figures here we presented earlier today um, at a session collated by Glorad. And they say that effectively it's about 59 companies in the UK outside of the top 100 with a, at least 10 patents. In Germany, it's 196, France, 85, Sweden, 33. So what you get a sense of is that, you know, it's a very shallow pool of corporations, relatively speaking, who are actively looking to develop their IP. And I think this is one of the opportunities from a corporate to university, is that it's not a big audience who are trying to say, how do we understand what we can bring and how we can work with universities? And relatively few of the corporations, about 50% according to MIT, that actually sponsor research actually do any licensing from that. And so the question, I think, the best practice that could be developed isn't so much to say, you know, there's all these great universities, there's great IP and research that's coming out. You know, it's being able to, I think, target a sort of almost Mittelstand level of corporations. The big ones know they're doing this. They can apply to Philips. They know how to talk to you guys. They know how to do it. But I would say the sort of the opportunity, the best practice is to say there's 59 companies in the UK that you can probably talk to and meaningfully connect them to Cambridge, you can meaningfully connect them to the set squared organisations. They just don't necessarily have yet either the resources funded or the people resources to do it. And I think, you know, it's not big picture, it's, you know, practically who would be the people that they should talk to and how do you engage them? And I think there's a role for the EIB and, you know, Intessa is probably a leading exponent of how practically to do this. So I would say that would be my, uh, my thought if you want to feedback. Just a quick reaction, maybe, because I think you were looking mainly at Shiva, right? Well, I was just designed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so, so Shiva, a quick design. reaction. But I, yeah, Julia. Well, yeah. Julia, yeah. Both Shiva. of you. Quick, I mean, I, I, so, 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 no, no, I think the quick reaction is absolutely. I mean, we are, when I say corporates, I should definitely add mid-caps here. Uh, I think your point is well taken. And, and ultimately, I think we, what we're talking here is um, tailoring the financing, as you say, to, to really enable them to do more even be beyond what their balance sheet would allow them, okay? And also their equity investors would allow them because equity is expensive and, you know, it's dilutive and all of that. So if you can provide them with that patient capital that then has some risk sharing capacity beyond just taking the whole balance sheet, but perhaps, you know, taking risk on this you know, activity that they do with university. That's the type of financing that companies have told us over and over again that they need for. So I don't know. I hope I'm not contradicting Julia's research. Um, maybe it's, yeah. I mean, no, no. I, 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 having those things is what makes people not worry yeah. about the money. But for instance, in our government, we have a, a program where you can ask for a scientist to sit in your company for a while. And this is for mid-caps. So they sit there, they understand what's going on, and then also you know, the other way around. Uh, but still not easy, still not easy. Uh, because I think human capital is, is, is more complicated to develop uh, the understanding of, of. I just want to sp speak to the American experience you were asking for Americans. Yes, I'm Trant from MIT. I run the startup <laughs> exchange at MIT. Um, I just wanted to say, I think you know, from our context, and every, every context is different, you know, we have membership programs with both industry and, you know, we're working on, uh, I think access to financial resources is not the challenge for an early stage MIT startup. 
So, you know, it, the context is slightly different, but, but nonetheless, I think we spend far much less time worrying about creating uh, our own venture funds, although we just did create one and call it something else, called it the engine, um, and we're bringing in other people. But I think that the real challenge for any other university, including uh, actually our next challenge, is to organize the human networks. Uh, because, you know, our membership programs have access to billions of dollars. So they come to our campus a lot. If we were starting to focus all our energy on building a 100 million fund or 200 million fund, that would be a waste because the money is there. It's how can you inspire those corporates? So it's building on uh, Jim's argument here uh, and, and tell them about the opportunity. So it's much more about the relationships, building the relationships and the ways that capital can engage on campus, finding attractive venues, events, uh, and bringing them in in the right way than it is about really worrying about fund structure. Because there are, you know, there's a big environment out there with money. Uh, we're trying to make the money applied smarter. Yeah, thank you. I'm afraid we, uh, we're the, the timer is on red, uh, which uh, actually my conclusion is uh, universities can do much more, corporates can do much more. And uh, we need to dig down. Uh, I want to thank the panel and, and particularly Jim. And congratulations on a wonderful conference, Jim. But maybe some closing remarks from you? No, no, not at all. I was just going to say that my thanks to you for organizing this is and just wonderful that you've all been able to make it. So I really appreciate it. But please join me in thanking you very much.